Okay, um, so good afternoon, everybody. And uh, my name is Tommaso Charlie. I'm Senior Research Fellow at UNU Merit and SPRU, University of Sussex. I'm extremely delighted to chair this session. I'll be extremely brief uh, because we have lots of content to cover. This uh, session was designed to bring together papers that look at various sources of unstructured data in order to understand what is the changing horizons in technologies and how this is affecting labor markets. So we're doing this a little bit in steps. We know uh, technologies are changing quite a lot. I mean, we all talk about ChatGPT, but it's not just ChatGPT. There's loads of other technologies. There's uh, uh, computational power, which is changing. Uh, these <coughs> Uh, there's blockchain, which is uh, uh, changing dramatically the way in which we encrypt and we use data. There's a lot of those technologies which are changing, which are shifting uh, quite a lot these skills which are needed and the skills which are demanded on the market. So this is what we're going to discuss today, using different sources of unstructured data in order to better understand what are the technologies which are emerging and how they're changing these skill compositions. So again, we're going to do that in steps. In the first paper, uh, Liz Gallagher and colleagues from uh, Nesta will look at how we can better understand the skills requirement uh, across the UK using online job uh, vacancies data. Then uh, we have two papers which look at the connection between emerging technologies. So we have one paper which uh, looks specifically at robot and look at the connection between what um, the, the design of robots is doing in terms of uh, 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 replacing occupations, saving jobs. And we're looking at another paper in which we're looking at a more uh, varied <coughs> number of applications, more varied number of technologies, and how industries and occupations are exposed to these technologies which are emerging. And then we combine this information uh, using both information on the skills from job ads and from the technologies in order to understand which companies were are adopting these technologies and how this is shifting the job market. So I won't take much uh, longer. I'm gonna introduce the first uh, speaker, uh, who's Liz Gallagher. We're gonna have this in a 15 minutes presentation, five minutes for you to ask uh, questions and, and, and particularly burning questions, detailed questions. Uh, so overall, one paper is gonna last for 20 minutes. And then in the end, we're gonna have a 10 minutes discussion about this all understanding of how technologies relate to skills and how this is changing overall. Liz, the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes plus five. Thank you. And let me change. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Oh, great. Hello, and uh, thanks for coming to see this talk today. So um, I'm going to be talking about what Nesta <coughs> is doing on extracting skills from online job adverts. And this work is done in uh, tandem with India Curl, who's in the audience, and uh, Kath Steeman, who's speaking later, and Jack Vines. Um, so I'm going to give a bit of an introduction to our work at Nesta um, and what, who Nesta are, and then talk about our algorithm for extracting skills from unstructured job adverts. Um, and then I'll do show a little bit of the analysis that we've done, just to get a flavor for it, and um, talk about what's next for Nesta. Um, so who are Nesta, and what is the Open Jobs Observatory? So Nesta are a charitable organization that design, test, and scale new solutions to society's biggest problems. And we have three mission areas. Um, the first one is a fairer start, which is about narrowing the outcome gap between children growing up in disadvantage and the local and the national average. The second is a healthy life, which is about increasing the number of average number of healthy years lived in the UK. And the third is a sustainable future, which is about accelerating the UK's transition to net zero. And we've had a number of projects on skills and jobs over the past years. Um, and as we become more mission focused as an organization, we're going to try to reposition this job's work um, so they're aligned with the missions. And I'll speak a bit about that in our uh, future work. So the Open Jobs Observatory is a database of online job adverts, um, which we've been collecting since January 2021. We now have six and a half million job adverts, which are collected on a daily basis. 
And we've built various algorithms to extract information from these job adverts, including location and skills, which is what I'll talk about today. And we've built various open source tools to investigate the UK la labour market on top of these um, extracted bits of information. And at the beginning, it was supported, this work was supported by the Department for Education and um, more recently, ESCO. So how did we extract skills from unstructured job adverts? So um, we started from the job advert level, like this, and we had two steps. The first was to identify skills within them, and the second was to map them to a, a standardized taxonomy. So when you see um, we would also like Excel, we want that to map to one standardized Excel skill, which in this case was use spreadsheets program. And um, how we did this was um, train a neural network to pick out the skills in the text. So as a team, we labeled hundreds of job adverts with um, where the skills were in them, and we used that as training data. And secondly, for the, the mapping, we were looking at the most semantically similar matches. Um, so we had the European Commission's ESCO taxonomy and Lightcasts. And we were trying to find those most similar matches um, between the extracted skills and their taxonomies. Um, and we've released this as an open source Python library. So um, that's including the trained model. So if you are familiar with Python, you can um, use this and extract skills from a, any, if you have a, a database of, of job adverts, you can use this. Um, and we also have a ton of information on model performance um, because our algorithm has many steps, and for each of them, they need their own metrics. And, but don't worry if you're not uh, familiar with Python. We have also have this um, front-end tool where you can select a uh, taxonomy to map to, uh, insert your job advert text, and press Extract Skills to get them. So the strengths of the algorithm, we feel, are that we can extract skills that haven't been seen before. So um, although the training data and the ESCO taxonomy don't contain the skill React, which is a programming language, it still managed to take it out of that text and furthermore map it to a suitable ESCO uh, skill of using scripting programming. So you can see how this could be useful for emerging skills, which perhaps um, taxonomies might not be up to date with. Um, and the library can be adapted to your chosen taxonomy. So we've kind of um, mapped skills to ESCO and to Lightcast, but that doesn't, you, you can also put your own taxonomy if you prefer. And thirdly, you can match to different levels of the taxonomy. So this might be handy um, when the job advert mentions a broad skill group rather than something quite specific. And in terms of quality, as I mentioned, there's a few different steps to the algorithm. So this was kind of our uh, way to calculate how well it was perf performing the whole way through. So um, we had a randomly sampled uh, data set of 171 skills that the algorithm had extracted and mapped to the ESCO taxonomy. And um, I mean, you can, you can see the results. The count is the, um, the number of those skills that were in each category. So, can see that our um, skill entity quality, how well it extracts those skills, we felt like it was very good 75% of the time and okay 19% of the time. And those okay type categories might be where it says um, trucks and vehicles is a skill and what it's missed the word driving trucks and vehicles. And so that's, that's not great, but actually when you match it to ESCO, it often still does a good job at adding that to driving vehicles um, as the standardized skill. So limitations of the, uh, of the approach, as you might expect, metaphors aren't dealt with that well. So understand the bigger picture is mapped to a skill about interpreting technical documentation. Um, and also multiple skills can be difficult. So we can use basic semantic rules to split up sentences like developing visualizations and apps into developing visualizations and developing apps. But sometimes the sentence can be quite complex and um, on, in that, those situations it can be hard to separate the skills. 
Um, so for these reasons, the kind of the results that you might see um, need to be uh, considered. So um, as I mentioned to, at the beginning, we have a, a data set of job adverts. So using a sample of this, we um, analyzed the most common skills that came out. And um, we had two focuses to our analysis. One was a uh, regional focus, and the other was occupation focus. So on the regional focus, we developed this um, online tool where you could select a region. So here I selected London. And you can see the most common skill for jobs <coughs> in London are communication, uh, followed by planning and scheduled events and activities. And uh, it, this kind of skill profile for each region also allows us to compare regions. So um, in this plot, you can see how London compares to the rest of the UK in terms of its skill profile. And you see that uh, London has more skills to do with software and finance than um, the rest of the country does. And just as a, as a comparison, I've also got Scotland here. So um, we had to group the Scottish regions because there wasn't as much data for them. Um, but you see that uh, communication comes out top for Scotland, followed by showing a positive attitude. And Scotland's particularly big on providing medical, dental, and nursing care um, in comparison to the rest of the country. So moving on to that occupation focus of the analysis, um, in a similar way, we could group the data by occupations. So in this, in this example, I've um, chosen the driver's occupation. And you can see the most um, popular skills asked for in driver job, ad job adverts. And that's um, number one is customer service. Um, and here are some examples of sentences from the job adverts. Um, and again, build, building on those skill profiles for each occupation, you can compare occupations. So you could see the most similar occupations to drivers, and that is um, those in the trades and labor category. Um, and you could see how this sort of thing might be useful for um, career transitions or indeed um, the risk of automation in your uh, occupation. I've also put uh, the same analysis for waiting and bar staff there. So as you may expect, the number one skill asked for is serving food and drinks. So what's next for our work at Nesta on jobs? So as I mentioned earlier, we have, um, we're becoming more mission aligned. And one of our missions is a sustainable future. So the next part of our work, and we've just started this project, is all about green jobs and skills. And what we want to do is get to a point where we can um, take at the job advert level, so like something like this, um, we can find three measurements, one of them being some greenness um, score for occupations, um, and an industry greenness score, and a skills greenness score. And we're hoping with this um, multi-dimensional and continuous a measure of greenness, we can build up a picture of green jobs without actually relying on one single um, one single um, definition of green jobs. And we want to build some products on top of this. And as I said, we're really at the beginning of this. Um, so we haven't done any of this yet, but we've been talking about it. So perhaps having some sort of interactive dashboard for the um, for the green measures, and uh, or we could perhaps partner with some job board to identify green skills and jobs on their website. And finally, that um, the mapping of green career transitions could also be possible. Um, and I think this is where we'd really like to chat with anyone interested in green jobs. Um, as I said, we're at the beginning of this project. So if anyone is interested in green jobs and wants to come and chat, then please do. Um, so I, I mentioned a few tools there. So that QR code should link to those online tools anyone is interested, but you can also come and chat later as well. And thanks for listening. Thank you, Liz. Fantastic. Thanks for doing that in such a short time. Uh, we have actually quite a lot of uh, time for questions. Thank you, um, Andrew Gurney from the Treasury. I thought that was very interesting, so thank you. My question was, um, you 
had the uh, said that the algorithm you know found it difficult to say uh, seeing the big picture, but presumably you can kind of overwrite that kind of thing and, and supplement the al algorithm. Is that right? Should I answer the questions one by one? As you prefer. Uh, yeah. What do you prefer, Liz? I prefer it. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, exactly. We can overwrite. So, and we have done that on a few occasions. Um, I think we had another metaphor in there, which I've now forgotten. But um, uh, yeah, we can, for, especially for the most popular ones that come up, which we feel aren't doing so well. We could create a mapper for those. Um, that was very interesting. Thank you very much. And I'm going to come and talk to you about the green skills later. Uh, just two very quick questions. Um, what is the time they mentioned? So you, you look at data today, or can you say get information over a certain period of time? Um, and do your skills map to um, occupations codes, standard occupational codes, and uh, industry codes? Is there a mapping between what you can find in the data and uh, six and SOX? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm glad you asked that because I've been thinking about six and six quite a lot recently. Um, on the first one, on the time component, we have data since January 2021, and in the analysis that I showed, we don't really do a time component, so it's just a random sample from from that data set. But yeah, I agree. I think it would be fascinating to do something over a time. And on six and six, yes. Yeah, so here we actually just use our um, uh, the the Data is from Read, so we use their occupation uh, codes, well, occupation categories. But in the green jobs work that we're, we're doing, so um, that's exactly the first hurdle to create those mappers between um, the job titles and SOX or the company names and SIX. So, yeah, I'd love to chat about that. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, super interesting. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about would you, would, the way you, in which you think about skills. So what's the theory behind this in a way? And because you mentioned positive attitude as one of the skills, but I mean, I agree it's a skill, but I don't know how that fits into as opposed to calculation or something different. So yes, thanks. Yeah, good question. We. Um I think our, our kind of way to do it as we were tagging the data was to be thinking about what we'd like the algorithm to, to take out. And we always had in mind that we'd map that to, to a taxonomy. So things like positive attitudes, if we took it out, then we can see that that might be a transversal skill within the um, skills taxonomy that we use. So we could always filter at the end to remove those types of skills, but there is, there's, potentially a problem in the fact that we have, um, it's a bit of ambiguity about what's a task and what's a skill. Um, and we tended to categorize tasks as skills, especially when they were very linked to a skill, like you will be making Python programs. You kind of need to have Python skills to do that. So, um, but yeah, it wasn't always crystal clear how to do that. Hi there, uh, Srimit H. Audrey, uh, Office for National Statistics. I was just wondering if you've done any work on looking at skills mismatch. So you focused on the labour demand or the skills demand, um, but whether once you pull that for information from your algorithm, can you do something similar with understanding the, the types of workers? Uh, and then the second bit was, have you thought about looking at how the skills change over time, like the demand of a certain job? Um, yeah, those are my two questions, thank you. So in terms of the skills mismatches, are you talking about the, um, the ca perhaps having a data set of the applicants to those jobs as well? I mean, it would be, yeah, it'd be really great to do something like that. We don't have that, that data set. Um, and the, da the, the model is trained on job advert text, not, um, I guess, like CV text. But we have been wondering whether it would, how well it would do on CV text. Um, we haven't tested that out. And in, in terms of over time, um, yeah, we haven't done anything on that in this project. Something we did do in our previous project was look at the effect of COVID on skill demands and yeah, changes. Um, 
but yeah, unfortunately, this project was a bit little less on the analysis and a bit more on the um, data science side. Thanks, Liz. I'm, I'm interested in, um, that was great presentation. Um, I'm interested, so let's go back to one of the question earlier about, for example, the positive attitude as soft skills. That's something that has been coming up recently in the literature. And I'd like to know whether there's any, from the text you analyze, whether there's any um, link with uh, training to something like that. So whether you can establish a link between the kind of skills required and, uh, uh, and what the firm aims to train on the job in case. That's something that would be extremely policy relevant, I think, beyond uh, the education, uh, you know, the formal education. It's something that <coughs> probably will contribute to this literature a lot. I, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Are you okay? Uh, just to say, I'm reading out one out loud from the Zoom. So there's a question from Vladimir uh, from Zoom. Are you doing any work on matching the jobs and skills you extract from job postings to qualifications coming out from the education system? So okay, uh, matching so educations and job ads. Uh, kind of relatively similar questions. Oh, sorry, you're gonna. Um, can I ask you, when you talk about um, green skills at the end, you also mentioned gender. Um, to what extent do you pick up uh, jobs which actually mention either gender or things like specific ethnic groups? In other words, the sorts of things which normally you're not, or age, the sorts of things which you're not normally supposed to um, uh, seek in job advertisements. So age, sex, and ethnicity, but anything else? Um, okay, so on the, um, the kind of question of qualifications and uh, matching to those. So on our, in our algorithm, we I didn't mention it, but we extract skills, but we actually also extract experiences. Um, because there's often parts of the job advert which are kind of a bit distinct. They might say that you need five years' experience in a lawyer's office or something like that. Um, and I feel like that could be used... The, the way we've done it in our tagging, I'm sure we could um, do the same for that kind of um, on-the-job learning, perhaps, um, and then label them separately as a different category. So, you know, uh, as I said, I didn't explain the experiences side, but... It, we do tag, this is a skill, this is an experience, this is a learning opportunity we could perhaps do. Um, I can't really remember, I, w I guess we weren't really looking out for learning opportunities, so I can't remember how the language really worked or how, how different it was to the language around skills. Um, yeah, and on the gender question, I feel like um, what we'd most probably do is rather than at the job advert level to extract at gender, as, as you say, it would be difficult. It would be more that we could take da data of um, gender imbalances in uh, occupations and match each job advert to their occupation and then to the, um, say, the gender pay gap or something like that. So you don't ever get a job, well, you do get a job, you do get questions about, sometimes which are very gender specific, but jobs are <laughs> but sometimes you get people done dynamic uh, questions of uh, uh, categories, um, and sometimes you get things like um, you, know, you have a retirement age of something or other, and if you get a certain other people. Can, is it okay if we pick up that during the panel because we're running out a little bit of time? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liz. Thank um, you. Thanks for that. Thank you very much. And next presentation is going to be, if we go quickly, Jacopo Staccioli from Cattolica University, Milan. Sorry, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. 
uh, Tomaso, for the introduction. So let me just say that this contribution is a joint, comes from a joint effort with colleagues Fabio Montobbio, Maria Enrica Virgilito, and Marco Vivarelli. And the title is Labor Saving Automation, a Direct Measure of Occupational Exposure. So we're trying to measure something, and I would be very, very happy to hear some feedback from the economics measurement uh, uh, community. So let me start. So uh, the scare of uh, swathes of mass unemployment triggered by uh, new digital technologies has uh, attracted a lot of attention, both in the policy and the academic debates. And as it happens, there's all sorts of opinion out there. Uh, some say that this time might be different because these are, let's say, general purpose technology that can be applied uh, on, on many different scales uh, with respect to, let's say, older, uh, older new technologies, if you wish. Uh, then there are shocking uh, amounts of occupational categories that are thought to be a high risk of being automated, and this would include not just the usual routine task uh, but also uh, service jobs and highly cognitive jobs. And finally, uh, of the very, very short uh, literature introduction that, I, that I'm going through, um, it is thought that technology especially destroys the occupation in the so-called middle part of the wage distribution. So you would have, let's say, uh, uh, an inverse U-shaped uh, exposure of these jobs uh, to uh, labels, what we will call labor-saving technologies. Now, in the literature, uh, there have been a few uh, measures uh, already there which we deem indirect and they usually use proxies uh, to, to, to measure proxies of, of, uh, of let's say, technology uh, um, or the impact of technology on the labor market, for instance, uh, shares uh, of computers in, in s economic sectors or the share of robots uh, in economic sectors of belonging. And also, um, they have constructed automation probability via experts' judgments and all sorts of classifier systems uh, and, and machine learning uh, tools. Now, as we said, these are all indirect measures, and this, there could be some confusion arising between firms and industry attributes, so uh, at the level of aggregation and also among heterogeneous uh, technological artifacts. What we want to do is to provide a direct uh, measure of, uh, of exposure, so a direct machine task uh, mapping for robotics patents. We are not the, the first to do that. There are few exceptions, but again, there are few exceptions in our, in our opinion, so uh, we might as well give our contribution, and we will ask questions such as how many jobs are at risk of being replaced by automation, and also which occupations are the most exposed. So the starting point of this paper is a previous paper of ours which focused on, uh, on patents with all the caveats that comes when you focus on patents. That is, you never know whether the, the, the inventions will ever get an application, get implementation in the production processes, of course. But let's say what we usually answer to this is that there is still some uh, level of economic commitment when you write a patent, when you get a, a patent grant. And so uh, what we look for is more like the research effort or the, and the heuristics therein. Uh, and let's say we can say less about the actual applications. That is why, let me open up parenthesis, we are applying this measure. Uh, we are currently trying to, to match this measure with uh, online job vacancy uh, data as they have been already uh, described. So again, our starting point are labor-saving patents within, in robotics, uh, let's say. And these are American patents uh, published between 2009 and 2018. We have developed, uh, let's say, a methodology to find out, to single out these labor-saving patents, which are patents that explicitly uh, state in their description uh, a labor-saving a labor message. And we do this first selecting robotics patents and then doing a, a textual query uh, at the sentence level with these uh, words that you can see here. Um, to, and, and then a lot of manual validations afterwards in order to find a total of close to 1,300 truly labor-saving patents. Let me just give you an impression of them. I'm going to read two excerpts. Automated systems such as robotic systems are used in a variety of industries to reduce labor costs or, and or increase productivity. And from the second one, the use of robotic technology results in improved management of information, services, and data, increased efficiency, significant reduction of time, decreased manpower requirements, and substantial cost savings. Emphasis is mine, but uh, let's say, 
as you can see, some patents, not all patents, but some patents in their description make some sort of economics of sharp economic statements. And we leverage uh, uh, on these uh, economic statements to find this uh, set, to single out this set of labor saving patents. Now, this is the workflow of, of our, our work. So, um, the, the Montauby et al. paper is our starting point. We have the set of labor saving patents from which in the present paper, which is what st stands at the right of the panel, um, we take the CPC code definitions, which, is the, which are the technological uh, classification codes that are assigned to patent during the examination process at the patent office. And the main part is we build a text similarity measure between the code definitions of these uh, CPC codes and task descriptions, which we take from the ONET, which is a, a dictionary, let's say, of occupation and tasks. And the ONET itself provides a means of aggregating these tasks into occupations. Uh, there will be some core tasks, some supplemental tasks, but let's say the architecture of how to pass from the task level to the occupation level is already there. And finally, we will uh, take some, um, some data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, about employment. And we will see, uh, actually, whether our measure makes sense or not. It gives, actually, some corroboration to what we find. So again, the main exercise is, is computing a text similarity measure between technological codes, which you take from the CPC classification, cooperative uh, patent classification, and uh, tasks from the ONET. And just to give you a, a couple of numbers, so we work at the four-digit level for CPC codes. There are 671 of them. And we have in excess of 19,000 different tasks, which are mapped to 900 plus eight-digit occupations. Now, um, we don't have a lot of time, so I don't want you to, to focus on the, on the technicalities here, but the way we construct the similarity measure is basically we look at uh, the frequency of co-occurring words between pairs of documents, pairs of texts. Uh, so on, on the one hand, you, we would have a CPC code. On the other hand, we would have a task. And we do this for every possible uh, pair of CPC codes and tasks. And we do not just count the frequency. We use what is called uh, TF, IDF. So we uh, tend to attach more weight to those words which are very specific to a, f to a small set of documents. And we attach less, uh, relatively less weight to those instead that might be frequent, but they appear uh, everywhere across the patent corpora, uh, or across the, the, the document corpora. And we do this, we do all this processing for both the uh, CPC um, corpus and the, um, and the ONET corpus. And in the end, we compute uh, the cosine similarity, which is what? Basically, we can see each uh, patent, each text as a vector in an n-dimensional vector space uh, defined by the frequencies of the underlying words. So we just want to compare pairwise pairs of vectors and compute the angle between them. So if two vectors have um, a parallel to one another, the cosine would be maximum, and it means that they have the same frequencies of the same words. If instead they are orthogonal, it means they do not share any words in common, and everything else in between. So just to give you an idea of this, we take uh, a random CPC code, A23F, which reads coffee, tea, the substitutes, manufacture, preparation, and infusion thereof, coffee and tea pots, and the rest. Um, and uh, we, uh, I will show you the cosine similarity, which is in the, in the box uh, to the right, with two uh, of ONET tasks. The first one would be prepare and serve a variety of beverages, such as coffee, tea, and soft drink. You can see there are four words, emphasis is mine, um, four words in common with the first uh, code definition, and the cosine similarity is pretty high. So it's a, it's a cosine which is bounded between zero and one. Uh, because the, the, the underlying matrices are positive definite. So the measure goes, between, goes from zero to one. The second task is uh, set up and operate machines such as lathes, cutters, shears, borers, millers, uh, grinders, presses, drills, or auxiliary machine to make metallic and plastic work pieces. Now, here we have just one word uh, in common with the first definition. And as you can see, it's also from a very different, let's say, uh, framework, a very different environment. And the cosine similarity would be very low. So this just for the sake of example. Now, we do this for every possible pair of, um, 
of uh, CPC codes and tasks. So we end up with a big matrix. Uh, uh, it's around 13 million entries, which is 671 uh, times 19,000 plus. And in this matrix, we would have one row for each um, CPC code, one column for each task, and with the added benefit of, of uh, knowing how to group occupations, which is the top row, as you can see, which is just groupings of tasks. And each cell would be the cosine similarity between uh, this pair of CPC codes and task. Now, so far, it's just, this is just an exercise of uh, basically measuring the similarity between uh, the CPC classification and ONET tasks. Now, we want to tailor this on our set of labor saving patents, and we do this by weighting the CPC frequency, so the rows, uh, by the, uh, the CPC frequency in the collection of labor saving patents. Okay, then of course what we're interested in is to know which tasks are more exposed, so we take column sum, and then finally we rescale between zero and one. So we can get basically a ranking of tasks first, and a ranking of occupations um, afterwards, uh, of which are most exposed to these labor-saving uh, robotics technologies. I will skip this, is about the task, uh, so the, the way to aggregate tasks uh, to, into occupations takes, takes care of or tasks that could be core or supplementary, and the way we do it reflects the internal, uh, let's say, the, the internal cutoffs in the ONET. Now, so this is the results that we find, and so this is the uh, top tasks by our uh, rescale similarity measure, so one does not mean a 100% cosine similarity, it means it's the top one, but I will show you the, the, the whole distribution in a second. So tasks which are most exposed are basically in logistics, uh, as we can see, so there's load materials and products into machines, uh, move levers or controls that operate lifting devices such as forklift, position lifting devices under, over or unloaded pallets, you get the idea. This is the, uh, the distribution of cosine similarity. We can see that most tasks are actually, actually display a zero uh, similarity within our measure, and most of the cosine similarity is very, very low. So what I showed in the previous picture, in the previous chart, is basically what stands to the right of the vertical orange line. Well, there's very little to be seen to the naked eye, so we are in the tail of the tail of the distribution over there. So tasks which have a humongously high uh, similarity. This is once uh, we aggregate by uh, occupations, we get a slightly bigger picture. We can see, of course, industrial truck and tractor operators. We find out that there is also a lot going on into uh, the automotive sectors, uh, like install, uh, repair, uh, machines, uh, etc. But again, packages and packages and, and so on. This, of course, uh, once we aggregate the cosine similarity measure to occupations, we get a more, say, bell-shaped um, distribution, and what I showed is on the right of the, of the vertical orange line. The final step is to take occupational data from the BLS, and we take employment levels, ex we, we, which exclude the self-employed, and the median wage uh, uh, for six-digit occupations, and we take a, a snapshot of uh, 2019 in 2019 for levels, and we compute a 20-year growth rate between 1999 and 2019. And these two panels show uh, robust, um, locally weighted uh, scatter plot smoothing estimates of um, basically the, the relationship between the wage level and the cosine similarity that we compute. So we can see basically that when the cosine similarity is high, so the um, occupations which we predict are most exposed uh, to labor saving technologies are the ones which are lowest, which are least paid. And in the second panel, we can see that basically in, in dynamic terms, uh, those uh, occupations which display a high cosine similarity uh, level uh, value are the ones that shrunk uh, over time. So you can see that basically the, the bottom half of the of the uh, of the pan of the of the graph is for negative employment growth between 1999 and 2019, which somewhat corroborates our measure. It says, okay, what we capture is something that actually have been saved, are, are jobs that have been saved uh, in this uh, time span at least. So let me wrap up a little bit. So the cosine similarity matrix that we compute is overall very sparse. Uh, we have very skewed distribution in both tasks and occupations. Having a high similarity is a very rare event, which also means uh, tangentially that there's a very low probability of having a false positive. 
uh, everyone comes up with their numbers of, of uh, how many people will lose their job. We want to uh, give our own. Uh, so if we consider the, just the top decile, so the top 10% of our similarity distribution, that would, uh, at least for, for the American workforce, that would uh, uh, amount to around 8.6% uh, of employees or 12.6 uh, million who are exposed to substitution. Although this could also be a conservative estimate because we do not know how many workers a single machine could uh, substitute eventually. Then we see that the exposure uh, to, to labor substitution is monotonically decreasing in wage. So we do not find the U-shaped pattern uh, uh, predicted uh, by, by Isimoglu and, and co-authors. We see that when we uh, aggregate to the two-digit uh, occupations, uh, these include transportation and material moving, so logistics, installation, maintenance and repair, especially in the automotive and engineering sector, but also some services like food preparation uh, and serving. Uh, we see that exposure uh, to substitution decreases in employment growth. Okay, so the innovative efforts are uh, directed towards what is the weakest and the cheapest segment of the labor force. And also, uh, something I, I didn't show, probably there's not a, a, enough time, the most affected sector is in fact manufacturing, uh, but there are also health and education services which rank uh, quite high. And this suggests some sort of pervasiveness of exposure uh, to labor saving technology along the supply chain, along different uh, sectors. And finally, when it comes to the US case, uh, we can see a geographic divide between the US, uh, the US coast and inland, especially so most of the uh, of the similarity, most of the uh, occupational exposure that we compute is concentrated um, around the Rust Belt and, and the southern state, which are the ones that actually underwent uh, deindustrialization uh, in the recent decades uh, and where the, you have the, higher, the highest prevalence of non-white communities. I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention so far. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much, Jacopo. Uh, we have time for Couple of questions, if we can take them together. Is it okay, Jakob? Yeah, sure yeah I'll write them now. Uh, yeah. Let me just. Um, it's coming. <laughs> well, you can start, Francesco. And okay. And uh, thank you, Jakopo, for the nice paper. Just a little question about uh, did, you have, uh, did you do any validation test? on uh, the criterion that you use to select the patterns over you which uh, you do text mining because you use uh, CPC code and then keywords. Maybe you are capturing some, uh, like, uh, the more similar patterns. Maybe w w there are some papers showing that, I mean, somehow CPC code may drive your analysis toward a direction. Maybe as a validation test, I don't think that your main result would change, but uh would be nice to see some test to uh to assess your the robustness of the criteria or, or this i mean or the list of patterns that you use to make the classification thank you thank you Richard. um can i ask about the thing which only came up at the very end but was implied at some of what you said you talked about you kept on showing us the people at the very top end <laughs> the most affected um you didn't talk about the very bottom end, except by implication, except that at the very end you suddenly said that there might be some health and education services which actually matched highly as well. They're the classic ones which you assume are not touched by such things. Can you say a little bit more about where they are? Thank you. Thank you. Jakob, yeah, please go ahead. Yes, okay. Uh, on the validation of, of labor saving patents. So this uh, actually belongs to our previous paper, but it's a very interesting question. So what we've done there is basically, so we run this query, this textual query at a sentence level. We look for triplets of words like reduce labor costs, reduce human intervention, and so on. There's 600 plus of uh, these triplets. Once a sentence is flagged by this uh, quite rudimentary algorithm, actually we did manually investigate each and every one of them. Uh, which, of course, uh, limited our ability of, uh, let's say, uh, the scope of application of, uh, of our, that's why we focused on robotics, basically. Uh, now we are currently, so those were validated manually. We, the algorithm uh, flagged 1,700 patents. We ended up with less than 1, uh, 1,300. So there were uh, 
that's around 20% uh, of false positive. We are trying to automate that step. And we are trying to do it, let's say, uh, in an automated way. We, uh, we found a way which uh, we have to leverage, let's say, on, sem on the semantic structure of the sentence and make sure that the, the verbal predicate, the, the direct object, is actually related to the verbal predicate uh, that we are looking for. And we, our way forward in, in that direction is to extend the same, the same exercise to any, any patent, not necessarily to robotics, because we could find labor-saving heuristics outside uh, uh, of robotics, uh, of course. So that's what we think could be one promising avenue of, of further extension. And the other, the other question actually is also about uh, the, the previous paper. So what's at the top, what's at the bottom? Here we see the exposure. In the previous paper, we, uh, we ran a topic model to find out what's going on in those labor-saving patents. And uh, if I remember correctly, what we find at the bottom are um, basically uh, mining, uh, mining operations, which I don't know exactly why, but it looks like they cannot be uh, fully automated or let's say maybe it's a uh, um, hazardous uh, workspaces uh, I, I don't know exactly but let's say this is what we find when it comes to to these uh, uh, substitution to robotics we see already that um, let's say there are some embry embryonal um, this um, heuristics uh, for automating cognitive activities. This is more into the AI uh, realm. Now, we have, uh, we, uh, we use a quite broad definition of robotics and we have a, about 20%, uh, 20 to 25% of overlap uh, with AI in this patent. So these patents are, uh, 20, one out of four of these patents overlap with uh, uh, other classifications that, that you could call AI. So that's what probably goes towards, um, let's say, this labor substitution in the service sectors and for more uh, cognitive activities, which is what also uh, Frey and Osborne seem to, uh, to find. Thank you very much, Jacob. I'm afraid we need to move to the next uh, presentation, but thanks a lot, and Thank a round of applause, please. For you. And now moving to all other technologies. Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Am I heard? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, now I'm going to present a common effort uh, over this paper. My co-authors actually are in the room, so in case the, the credit is also to them. So this paper differs from the previous presented in uh, several, several ways, though it shares the idea of exposure. In this case, we also uh, compute the exposure of industries to emerging automation technologies, uh, not only to occupations. And uh, here we are not focusing only on robotics patents. We actually identifying first uh, the broad uh, the set of emerging automation technologies that include robotics, but actually by far broader, including AI, uh, Internet of Things, uh, neuromorphic computing. So actually, potentially many uh, different uh, emerging technologies that impact uh, further down the line industries and occupations. And my task actually very hard uh, this time because I will have to present one and a half paper. So this is the main paper, and I will also briefly give you an overview of what we did in the previous paper that produced actually the set of emerging automation technologies. Um, so there are plenty of technologies that are emerging actually every year and uh, their development uh, pace is quite fast. So in general, we wanted to know whether uh, these technologies uh, uh, have an impact on the industri industries, markets, and occupations, uh, and skills, even down the line, and that's next presentation is about. Uh, and what we wanted to uh, see if uh, at all these emerging technologies are relevant, and if they are relevant, where they are relevant. So. Our contribution is twofold. First, we propose a methodology to do, uh, to compute the exposure. And second, uh, the very outcome of that uh, uh, methodology is a dynamic mapping of industries and technologies and occupations and technologies in terms of exposure of uh, the latter. And uh, uh, this can inform many perspectives and it's also an updatable uh, uh, outcome. So as soon as new technologies arrive, we can detect them and then we can also update the mapping of exposure. Uh, so, sorry, spoiler alerts. Uh, the main findings are the following, that actually occupations uh, that are involved in non-routine tasks 
are getting more exposed to this emerging automation technologies that we identified. Uh, the, in, in terms of ESCO classification uh, of occupations, uh, the most exposed category uh, at the broad aggregated level is uh, technical associate professionals. So it's uh, ICT operators, uh, health associate, process and control technicians, financial associates, etc., etc. And the two next ones are uh, machine operators and professionals. So professionals uh, like doctors, medical doctors, which was uh, what Jacopo was saying before, that maybe that's more related to AI, and uh, we will see one example of such automation technology that does affect uh, medical industry. Uh, and uh, the point that these effects of uh, exposure to emerging automation technologies, there is a difference, substantial difference between industries and uh, occupations that produce these emerging technologies and those that are purely recipients of such. And we will see how that happens, but uh, long story short is that uh, producing sectors are associated with employment growth, uh, and uh, while the sectors that are users will decline uh, uh, when, it, when it comes to heavily exposed uh, users uh, to the automation technologies. And these results are robust regardless of the level of aggregation of taxonomies that we are using. So what we're using is the set of uh, emerging automation technologies which we identified in the uh, paper uh, with my co-authors. Uh, and uh, this is a set of uh, 500 emerging uh, technologies based on patents and also 500 uh, technology clusters of technologies based on publications. So I will be giving and talking a lot about patents, but keep in mind the same work is done or is going to be finalized for publications as well. Uh, and uh, using these technologies, it's our input in this paper on exposure. And uh, we will identify the exposure of, of uh, industries at uh, NACE to uh, uh, and uh, occupations uh, or at ESCO 08. Uh, then we will want to put that occupation measure uh, in the wild and test whether that exposure metric that we computed is at all explanatory. It has any explanatory power in terms of change in employment that we observe over a decade from 2010 to 2019. Uh, we will do two regions, one is uh, EU and uh, 28 countries, and then we'll go down to German uh, uh, data specifically. I will explain why. So emerging uh, technologies. So here I will just give you a very brief uh, overview of our methodology uh, and results. They are not, uh, would not be so visible, but maybe down the line it will. So first we will take, uh, we take the patents uh, and their titles and abstracts, we concatenate them, we produce the uh, uh, document level embeddings with the uh, sentence transformers. Uh, and this is our starting point. This is our data that we cluster. Uh, first, we want to identify the most novel uh, uh, patents, the most, most novel documents inside that big set. Uh, we are doing that uh, in a, with a local outlier factor uh, algorithm detection. So we're basically creating the um, seeds of novelty within that whole space of uh, patent documents. And then around these seeds of novelty that these documents are outliers compared to the rest baseline uh, corpus, uh, we create neighborhoods of similarity to these seeds of novelty, which we call offshoots. So our final uh, sample of novel patents, uh, which around 200,000 patents, is this novel plus their similar neighborhoods. Uh, and this uh, sample we cluster into 500, what ended up being 500 emerging automation technologies. Uh, they are various. Uh, these are technologies uh, with application of blockchain to security and data transmission. These are the neuromorphic computing. Uh, these are also neural networks in application to medical imaging. This is a very broad range of uh, emerging automation technologies. And these uh, 500 technologies is that what we are working with for the exposure. Just a side note, uh, uh, though very important, every cluster out of these 500 uh, clusters characterized by five metrics that identify a stage of emergence of each uh, of this technology cluster. And uh, it's a radical novelty as a share of novel patents inside that cluster. It's a prominent impact as a share of the most cited patents in that cluster, and so on and so forth. So we properly follow the methodology in order to say, yes, that's emerging really. It's not just a cluster of something that kind of novel but does not move anywhere or has no impact down the line in terms of timeline. Now we are moving towards the exposure scores, and this is the flowchart of our um, 
our methodology in that paper uh, on exposure. So as I said, we are taking uh, patents, uh, patent documents uh, using their title and we uh, produce embeddings of those. Then we take industrial descriptions at a certain level of aggregation. We chose the three level, uh, three digit uh, NACE and also occupations and their titles and description of tasks that occupations do. Here I would like to stop and draw your attention to the fact that industries, they are descriptions of applications uh, for the technologies. So this uh, economic activity where the technologies are applied or produced. Uh, while occupations, they are uh, re represented by titles and tasks. These are um, uh, categories uh, and the functions that these technologies potentially can perform. So occupations are matched with technologies based on tasks and or functions that these technologies can do. Uh, and industries are based on economic activities uh, that these technologies can be applied or produced in. Then we, uh, uh, we get these combinations of patents and industries or patents and occupations and we compute cosine similarity that Jakob did a good job explaining it before. So uh, cosine similarity basically how similar the description of the uh, industry and uh, uh, technology described in that patent. The same for occupation and technology. And then we get a set of potentially relevant pairs. But this is at the patent level. But we have, as you remember, 500 technologies. And we, then we need to aggregate this uh, patent level uh, exposure to the technology level exposure. So we have a metric uh, of uh, exposure of an industry to a specific technology uh, in an aggregated way. So to give you an understanding what how that looks, example of a technology that we have is medical image processing with machine learning. Uh, this is a cluster of patents uh, represented, summarized in phrase. And then to this technology, which industries on the left and which occupations on the right you see and how strongly it is uh, it's exposed. So this last column in both the tables is the strength of exposure. Uh, it's aggregated cosine similarity over all the patents in that cluster. And in industries, you can see that this, uh, this is a mixture of uh, industries that use that technology and industries that produce that technology. So the user industry is hospital activities and producer industry is clearly manufacturing uh, of medical and dental instruments and uh, supplies. One of, not all of them. And uh, the, this for what concerns uh, industry and occupation. Here I invite you to look at the code of industry or of occupation and notice that a lot come from this uh, code three, the most, uh, the, the first uh, digit in the code, which uh, is like seven out of 11. It's c coming from this uh, code three. It is exactly the, what, what I talked before about pre results is uh, uh, technicians and associate professionals. So a lot uh, professions come and occupations exposed to this particular technology come from that particular broader category of occupations. Then it comes the code two, uh, which is like three out of uh, 11. Uh, these are the professionals. So you see two, uh, 22, 11, it's generalist medical practitioners. So these are the doctors technically. And uh, yeah, and uh, so just moving further uh, because of time constraints, uh, this is actually a tree map of how different uh, sectors of uh, uh, occupations, the, the bigger groups of occupations are exposed and the industry as well. So industrial exposure is clearly this manufacture of uh, computer and electronic optical products, information service activities. These are the two industries that clearly produce a bunch of digital automation technologies. So the most exposed are the producers by ident uh, identified, but there are a couple of uh, users, financial service activities in the center of the left uh, uh, and advertising market research, retail and trade, so 47. So these are heavy users of the emer uh, emerging automation technologies. On the left, it is occupations. And here we also see that there are some, we do not identify the producer or user at the, uh, at the occupation side, but we still can see that ICT operators and user support technicians, uh, uh, the process control technicians, they are potentially producers uh, uh, of uh, emerging automation technologies, as well as uh, other uh, some occupations that uh, are pure recipients of these technologies. Uh, 
I would like to skip the identification of uh, user and producer. Uh, shortly speaking, it is uh, we leverage the portfolio, pa patent portfolios of companies that file these patents that constitute our 500 technologies. And based on their portfolio and specialization in patenting in a specific industry, we can identify whether patent is uh, using or producer of that technology. And then we aggregate up to the 500 technologies. So this picture. Uh, Two on the right is industries, on the uh, left, uh, um, so, no, sorry, vice versa. On the left is industries, on the right is uh, occupations. Uh, what ca uh, we can see here is an important pattern that from the top left to bottom right, uh, if we look at them here, uh, this area from diagonally down, this gradual specter of, uh, uh, of industries that produce, uh, uh, that use heavily the um, emerging automation technologies down to those that produce actually uh, emerging automation technologies. So this 26, the com semiconductor industry basically, 62, which is information uh, service activities. Uh, this is the area where rather producers are allocated, and here there is the area where the users are allocated and then gradually morph into producers. The same holds for occupations. So these are the agricultural workers that are pure recipients of technologies, and here there are those who, uh, occupations that are rather producing the technologies. Uh, now, putting in the wild uh, uh, the exposure metric that we computed, uh, we uh, uh, looking at the effect of exposure on the employment growth. Very similar to what also Jacopo presented, we relate the two metrics and uh, we see whether there is an effect. So if we look at the model one, we see that actually the exposure metric is positive, meaning that the higher the exposure, the more employment. So it's actually job creation or uh, augmentation of existing ones. Uh, but then if we include more information in the model and we include the uh, producer and user in particular, we observe that actually that coefficient drops, it becomes significant negative because uh, the explanation will break between producers and users. This is for the whole uh, country, uh, EU uh, region. So it's not a specific to Germany yet, uh, but I come to this in a second. And the producer, uh, effect of producer maybe is more visually uh, uh, clear here because uh, this red uh, line is a producer. It's um, employment growth rate conditional on the level of exposure by occupation. So here from the left to right, the exposure increases and from the bottom to the top, the growth rate becomes from negative to the positive. And in case of producers, we see the, the more you are exposed as a producer, the more likely to see the growth in employment. While uh, interesting, the, if you are in the producer sector, uh, pre in the occupation in the producing sector, uh, but low, low exposure of the occupation, then the effect on the growth rate, uh, on the employment growth is negative, meaning that uh, occupations in the producer sector that are Low, with low exposure that do not benefit a lot from new uh, technologies that arrive and means that uh, they are getting either eliminated or substituted or outsourced. Uh, the effect uh, for light users is the opposite. I, instead, the more exposed uh, an occupation in the industry that is categorized as light user, the more likely that the growth uh, rate will, uh, the, the, mo the smaller the growth rate which gets to negative. Uh, then, because here we have uh, the NACE one, uh, it's very aggregated uh, sectors here in order to produce this graph. So it's uh, like manufacturing is uh, in the NACE category, it's C, and there are both beverage, um, producers of uh, beverages and producers of computers. They are in the same class C. So we need to disaggregate and we only had available data to test that for Germany. That's why we moved to only Germany from the whole EU and uh, test the same uh, specifications just for, now we have data on two digit uh, level of disaggregation, uh, meaning that we have more uh, diversity, we have more decomposition power to unpack. And uh, here the effect becomes even more pronounced that the higher the exposure, uh, the more likely that uh, occupation in the producing sector grows, that still holds. Uh, but then we have this U inverted shape that if you are a heavy user, uh, if your industry uh, and occupation um, as a heavy user, 
the uh, Q1 category is the heavy user, Q4 is the lightest user, so it decreases. Uh, so the, the more uh, a category, uh, the more an occupation is exposed uh, in the heavy user, the, the smaller is the growth rate, so it actually, the, the more negative the growth rate gets. So uh, that we witness potentially the substitution effect uh, once the occupation is exposed a lot in the heavy user sector. So it may be capital deepening. Think about the finance industry where uh, algorithmic prediction is already done uh, a lot and then uh, coming with AI and other more automated, uh, more intelligent technologies, that becomes even more refined prediction. So it uh, becomes even cap capital, with capital deepening, it becomes even more uh, substituted and people are less hired anyway. So that's uh, our main takeaways. Uh, uh, occupations uh, uh, that are uh, uh, affected are actually non-routine tasks because also we take into account the service innovations and service uh, related uh, emerging technologies. Uh, producers, they associated with uh, higher um, exposure and creation of jobs, while ex producers that associated with low exposure, they actually experience substitution and hence negative growth rates. And that pattern holds across different uh, levels of aggregation. Thank you for your attention. I'm sure you have questions. Please <laughs> ask. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, all that material. So we have, uh, yeah, uh, space for one of two quick questions. Anybody would like to start? We have a question. Um, of course, there are large numbers of data points on those charts. It's very difficult to actually see who is who, except possibly some of the end points. But um, can you uh, say a little bit more about those who are at the very bottom end of exposure? And again, I'm particularly interested in occupations in things like the health sector where exposure might be um, very, very limited. And I'm not talking about A, the AI end, as I, we talked about earlier. I'm actually talking about the exposure to, um, uh, say, robotization type products. So I'm talking about, I'm talking about services, certain kinds of services within the health sector. To answer right now, or uh, just like any other question popping up? Okay, yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, we at the moment uh, haven't looked into which particular technologies drive the exposure, so there could be uh, many technologies that we have and we cover a very broad spectrum. But uh, health uh, uh, workers like medical and pharmaceutical technicians they are quite exposed, you can see they're right here. Sorry. In the other, sorry, what? So, like the nurses or yeah, they they are uh, this particular. Uh, so it does not, it's not labeled in the classification to the details potentially that you are asking. Uh, but the point is that the ho almost all medical uh, occupations, they are quite exposed. So there are not, no, uh, because they are exposed to not only product innovations, they're also exposed to service innovations. And uh, like uh, uh, the software that helps to automate the job that is done in health, for health professionals and associates. But there's this paramedical and other health professionals exactly there where you are, which uh, is quite high. Um, I'm afraid we have to, sorry for, for the next one. Um, yeah, we need, thank you very much, Kate. Um, another round of applause, please. And we have to ask you <laughs> last presentation to give people time, um, which is now combining everything together, hopefully.
and Fabian is going to give the next presentation. Thank you very much. Um, okay, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, let's work. Bit? Okay. Uh, so, hello, uh, my name is Fabian uh, Petit. I'm a research fellow at the University of Sussex at the Science Policy Research Unit. So, I'm going to present to you uh, the next part of this pipeline, which was about uh, identifying um, those emerging technologies and then looking at their exposure. And here we are looking at the adoption of those uh, emerging technologies. So because we are running a bit out of time, I will try to keep it uh, short. Uh, so I might skip some slides, but of course I'm really open for discussion after the presentation. So uh, I think uh, being the fourth in this uh, session, I don't have to motivate the question, uh, but basically until now we have looked at uh, the exposure of industries and occupation uh, to those emerging uh, automation technologies. Um, the thing is that we know little about the effective adoption of um, those um, technologies. If you think about autonomous cars, neural networks, cloud computing. Um, so we want to understand whether those uh, firms in Europe, for instance, they really adopt or not those technologies which are really recent and developed during the last decade. The problem is that you cannot knock at the door of companies and ask them, did you adopt this one and what about this one? So what you can do, though, is that you can look at online job vacancies and you can look at the skills and knowledges that they ask for. And if you are able to make a link between those skills and knowledges with the technologies, then you can see by the change in the labor demand for those skills and those technologies whether uh, the firms are massively adopting those emerging technologies or not. So this is basically what we do. So we identify European firms' uh, adoption of um, science, technologies, and innovations uh, that emerged between 2010 and 2020, which are basically the data that Kate pre presented in the previous, um, in the previous talk. Um, and we look at this through the change in the labor demand. Our identification strategy is that basically we assume that the changes that, uh, that we observe in the labor demand for skills and knowledge that, that, again, are related to those emerging STI, reflect the firm's adoption of those latter. Um, in terms of the preview of the results, uh, we find that basically a fifth of the emerging STI are adopted across, but also within European regions, industries, and occupations. Um, two fifths are adopted either across or within, but not both. And lastly, um, the remaining parts are not massively adopted across those regions, industries, and occupations in Europe. Uh, we also can find that half of those uh, STI are going to be labor augmenting. So they will be, they will be complementary uh, to labor, um, and they will increase the demand for skills and knowledges. But we also find that half, uh, so the other part, are labor replacing. In terms of contribution, um, we show that uh, basically three-fifths of those um, STI are adopted massively across uh, European firms. Um, we also contribute to the literature on labor technology complementarity because we provide a novel data-driven methodology that is based, again, on state-of-the-art NLP techniques, uh, such as set transformers that uh, Kate presented earlier on. Um, and lastly, we are uh, using those um, CDF um, so database uh, with about uh, 180 million online job vacancies um, that were posted between 2018 and 2022. Um, so that are the contribution, those are the contributions of this paper uh, so far. So in terms of um, this presentation, I will uh, basically give you an overview of the data. So we have three data sources. The first one are the emerging um, uh, STI, which are identified in the first paper. Uh, by, uh, led by Shugat, who is here, and also in which uh, Tommaso and um, Kate participated in. And so we have lots of uh, novel patents that which are classified into 90 emerging STI, which are very uh, much more aggregated than what you saw before. But we have basically autonomous vehicle, uh, you have cloud storage, those kind of uh, technologies. The second source is, as I said, uh, online job vacancies, with uh, millions of online job vacancies for which we have data uh, information on occupation at four digits, industry at two digits, and region at nuts free. Um, and those include, uh, they include about uh, 2,600 uh, skills and knowledges. For those skills and knowledges, we are going to uh, rely on the ESCO classification with uh, three level of use. So basically you will find skills which are specific to either an industry or an occupation, cross sector, uh, so transferable, or uh, transversal. So that is the classification that we are going to leverage. 
Um, in terms of the methodology, so this figure is a bit similar to the one that you observed before. The difference here is that we are going to have the patterns from which we get the titles, um, the skills and the knowledge is from which we'll get the description. We are going to derive the embeddings, uh, as Kate previously explained, um, and we are going to get the cosine similarity. And then we do a bit of filtering because you don't want to get spurious uh, links between skills and um, technologies. Uh, so for each pattern, we are going to retain the top 10 skills which lowers down basically the number of relevant pairs, and then you aggregate at the technology level, and then you apply a second filtering, and you end up basically with, um, with about uh, 2,200 relevant pairs of skill and technology. So here is an example of cloud storage. Um, for instance, um, what you have as a label is the skill, so this is a knowledge, specific knowledge about data storage, data warehouse, no SQL. And on the right hand side, on the last column, you have the, the score, uh, the cosine similarity score uh, for between that skill and that technology. And so you see that those skills are quite relevant regarding uh, that technology. Um, so here there are a bunch of uh, statistics um, regarding the, the matches we get, the pairs between technology and skills. And as you can see, on average, um, uh, technology is matched with 25 skills or knowledges. Um, and those which are paired are rather similar to those which are not paired. Uh, the difference being that most of those are uh, knowledge specific. So there is an overall representation which makes sense because we are looking at technologies for which we want knowledge which are specific. Um, here is an example of the top three match skills and knowledges. Um, so just to give you an insight of what are uh, the skills which uh, are very important in our technologies, so administer ICT system, for instance, or electronic communication. Um, the thing is that we identify those adoption through the change in the labor demand. So we have to characterize the labor demand. So I will just present you uh, what is basically the extensive labor demand, which is the number of online job vacancies which are demanding skill S. Uh, in a given region, given industry, given occupation, given year. And then you have the intensive labor demand, which is the share of online job vacancies in that specific scale, uh, cell, which is demanding the skill S. So one is the measure of the diffusion across the industries, the occupations, and the regions. The other one is a measure of the intensification of the use of those technologies uh, within those cells. So then you aggregate, uh, so it's very simple here. You have weighted aggregation for intensive labor demand. Once you aggregate, basically you can look at the country level where um, there are some change in the labor demand. So this is for the skill, uh, for the knowledge about embedded system. What you have here is the, on the left-hand side is the level in 2018. What you have on the right-hand side is the change between 2019 and 2022. So what you observe is that the role of you, you want basically to account for uh, country heterogeneity with uh, such things such as fixed effects in an empirical specification, which is the following. Um, but before presenting the empirical specification, just one word about um, this um, as assumption. So we, as I said, we assume that um, when we observe a change in the labor demand for skills S, which is related to technology K, we are basically looking, we are basically observing the firm's adoption of that technology. Um, and so when it's a positive change, it means that the, the firm as adoption will be labor augmenting. When it's a negative change, it gonna, it's going to be re labor replacing. Um, and what we are going to look is, is the change in the labor demand for, a set of, for the skills which are linked to, technology, with, to specific technologies between 2019 and 2022, conditional on their level in 2018 to account for uh, reverse to the mean. Um, so here is the specification um, for the level, but the one that we are interested in is this one. So you have the change on the left-hand side in the labor demand for skill uh, S in country C. Um, you have the dummies if basically, so this is the one, if the pair between the skill and the technology is relevant, this will be accounted for, and this is where we are going to get the variation to identify whether those technologies are adopted. So um, just a map of what's going on. So what you observe uh, at the top, um, so the northeast of this figure, are the technologies which are um, adopted. So it means that there is a change uh, in the extensive labor demand, uh, but also a change in the intensive labor demand. So there, are, there is diffusion across occupations, industry, and regions. 
uh, as well as identification in the use of those. Um, and this is positive, so it's labor augmenting. Um, so you have things such as medical device, real estate, recycling. You also find robots, uh, interestingly. Um, on the bottom here, you have technologies which are labor uh, substituting, labor replacing. And those are uh, the, the skills which are related to those technologies tend to be less and less demanded, which means that they are getting replaced by those technologies. Um, we can derive lots of different figures um, uh, from that. Um, there will be, of course, soon a working paper. But we can summarize by saying that in this paper, we are able to look at the diffusion and the intensification of the use of those technology through the change in the labor demand, which brings me to the conclusion, to repeat what I said in the introduction, is that basically 23% are adopted across uh, and within European regions industry and occupations, uh, whereas uh, 38% are not massively adopted, but yet, because we are looking at, uh, again, um, emerging technologies which emerged during the last decade. Um, yeah, so thank you for your attention. And of course, I would be very happy to answer to any question, and you can reach me uh, if you are interested in this literature. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabian. That was extremely short. Uh, so we have plenty of time for uh, questions. Um, Anybody would like to ask for clarification or? Yeah. So just on your last bullet there, 50% of emerging technologies are. Sorry, can you, can you speak a bit louder? Yeah, so 50 your last bullet, 50% of emerging technologies are labor augmenting. Yes. 50% replacing. Is that by the number of technology rather than? the uh, amount of employment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is like out of the 90 uh, technologies we identify, 50, roughly 50, 50, between labor augmenting and uh, labor uh, replacing. But this is not weighted by the current employment. So I mean, it would be quite interesting just to know, you know, what's, what does that translate to in, in uh, employment space? Yes, that's a good point. Thanks. Any questions? Thanks. Um, the other question, uh, the question I have in mind was, do you, so some technologies are labor augmenting and some technology are labor, labor saving. However, it seems to me that it's unlikely that these technolo technologies will be adopted in a void in the sense that, it, is it, do you have any sense of how likely it is that technologies are adopted in bundles by the same industry and what the co-occurrence is between labor augmenting and labor replacing technologies within the same industry and even better industry occupation? Yes. Um, I think that's a very good question. Uh, so as you see, uh, I, I've been a bit fast on this, but, but what we do is that we have like the um, change in the labor demand at very granular level, but then we aggregate um, at the moment because we are really interested in the massive adoption of those. Uh, but what you have in mind is basically whether um, those technologies could be adopted as bundle. Uh, but this also, uh, and but also, what is underlying is the fact that because of this uh, massive aggregation, we are missing lots of heterogeneity that can happen at the regional level or across occupations. Um, and basically, in the next projects, that, which will be related to this methodology and those data, we are going to dig at a more uh, granular level that we have available, but that for the moment we aggregate it for, um, to make the message more uh, simple. Um, I think we would be able to identify the bundles uh, in, if we think in terms of uh, industries and uh, occupations, but I cannot say more at the moment, but thank you. And we have a question here. Yeah, thanks. Um, you had to whiz along, um, and you whizzed along at one stage. Um, I think it was in the last graph where you mentioned my favorite thing of robots, and you made a comment about the robots, but I didn't have enough time to actually ah, yeah. see what they were doing. Yeah. yeah there. Could you, okay. could you just say a little bit more about it, and per perhaps could you... I mean, it is relative to labor demand, because it's also in relation to the very first question about... Was it technologies that you were talking about, or were you talking about employment? Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much um, for um, 
spending a bit of time uh, to allow me to spoil a bit of time about this comment I made quickly. Um, so what you see on this slide, which is a bit of a reshuffle, so here you have the level of the labor demand in 2018, and then you have the change on the y-axis. Um, what is very interesting here is to see that robots, basically, the change in the demand for skills and knowledges which are related to robots increases, but only in the regions, occupations, and industries in which it's already present. So it means that there is an intensification of the use of this technology in those specific cells. But if we look at the extensive labor demand, which is looking at the diffusion across those regions, industry, and occupations, you observe that actually um, the change is not significant, which means that ba basically, if you want to extrapolate a bit more, uh, places in which there are already robots are using even more and more robots, whereas places in which they don't have robots yet are not necessarily adopting or increasing the labor demand for skills and knowledges which are related to those latter. Thanks. So, so I just had one, which was, do you have any views on whether the pace or extent of the intensive and extensive margins have changed over time? So do, do firms, are firms adopting technologies much more quickly in more recent times, or is it spreading more across industries or regions? It's just that time dynamic. Yeah, so, yeah, so I think your question relates to the point, uh, uh, to the previous point, because you are interested in, in uh, spatial uh, differences, right? In the adoption, uh, or, or it could be like industrial differ differences between industries. Yeah, so uh, for the moment, uh, we haven't impact, unpacked this, but of course, it's on the agenda. Thank you. OK. Um, we started a little bit late, but I was informed that we need to uh, close in about three, four minutes, because we need to set up the room for the next uh, session. Um, so um, I think instead of having a panel here, we're probably having a panel during the coffee break. Uh, so <laughs> I, I invite you to sort of, uh, approach uh, all of the speakers um, during the coffee break for general questions. But uh, we have a, still a couple of minutes. So if there's any question to any of the papers, uh, please, uh, please do raise. There's one more. <laughs> Unexpectedly, there's, there's one more question. Can I, can I ask the question which I started off asking it to the very first? Is it to everybody or just? And I'm now going to put it to everybody as well because we talked about, um, we've, we've talked about jobs and, uh, but have we talked about things like, we talked about regions as well, but we did talk very briefly about gender dimensions of jobs. Is there anything that any of you can say about that as well, given that that is something which once upon a time we used to be mainstreaming i think was the word in question so is there anything that any of the others can say about that so god maybe you can talk about your work but <laughs> <laughs> so i think the main trouble with the finding gender dimension in the european data is that explicit gender requests are banned so what uh, Liz suggested that maybe you could look at occupations, that would be very hard. But in a couple of papers, and one of them I'm, I'm presenting tomorrow as well, so in that we look at which skills are associated with women and men and by, by the employers based on online job advertisements using a couple of different methods. And then we look at how different uh, applicants respond to the mention of those skills to sort of figure out how applicants perceive those skills. And there are a bunch of papers. There's one paper by Kohn and co-authors which, uh, which got published in Journal of Development Economics. And it looks at uh, these gendered words uh, in China. There's another paper which kind of uses our word skills to extend the uh, gender preferences in uh, in case of China again. So uh, the best possible way to be uh, would be to maybe look at these uh, uh, maybe psychological uh, aspects and then find out which words are more similar to words associated with women. I just think I think it's interesting that you can go and do that in somewhere like China, where they're relatively shameless about what they're allowed to ask for. But I mean, yes, I, I suspect, and it comes back to the, the 
answer to the first question is that you're actually going to have to look at these jobs in terms of their breakdowns, in terms of their occupational composition in total. I mean, I, I came to this not because I was asking questions about gender, but many years ago I used to work on the area of age and employment. And I was actually sort of interested in some of this because are these the kinds of industries which are favouring well, in that case, it was certain age groups, and they, hence I come to, say, gender groups or um, ethnic groups or something like that. But are that, you know, do, do these things spread out evenly, or do they tend to touch certain um, demographic groups more than others? And, I mean, that was what was actually interesting, finally, about our final presentation, is because you actually did start drilling down to at least to the level of regions so you've got beyond just sort of industries and occupations but you've got to do places as well thanks L uh, let me add one more thing so these gender associations are also changing a lot over time as the exposure to these technologies is in increasing and that's yeah i mean that's 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 precisely the point i mean uh, can i very quickly i mean many years ago i worked in uh and i was working in germany at the time and the um education and employment ministries were terribly keen about opportunities to increase it was called girls in men's jobs was the to effectively the translation of it and because this is a very long time ago the men's jobs were terribly typically men's jobs and the girls who were going into it were very much the people who didn't go into them then and the point is does that still apply? Well, one knows to some extent it doesn't, but one knows to some extent that there are still very definitely, however much there might have been some movements, um, there is certainly quite a lot of solidification as well there. So I think it's a very interesting question, and hence I'm interested in what you say, and hence I was interested in what a lot of people said today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks to the audience for staying so long and eating a little bit into the uh, the, the coffee break. I, I hope you get a glimpse about how much can be done uh, with the existing data to understand better how different technologies emerging uh, will affect jobs positively and uh, negatively in the future. So thanks a lot. I'd like to thank again um, Liz, Kate, uh, Jacopo and uh, Fabian for presenting really interesting results. Thank you. See you later.